Hi there, welcome to our three part series on Jesus Christ. As you can see, this is part one, looking at the man and his mission. When I was thinking about the man, Jesus Christ, and his mission as a subject, I have to admit that I got stuck for a while. I was trying to figure out how to approach this subject in a way that would be understandable, interesting, not too long, but still do justice to what is a very important topic. So fingers crossed. Let's just say right up front that we as Christadelphians believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and that it provides us with everything we need to know about God himself, about God's plan and purpose with the earth, about his son, Jesus, and if we're interested about what we need to do. So all of our information for today's talk comes from the Bible. There will be a few verses to follow. And if there's anything you're not sure of, feel free to contact us to ask, and I'll put up our contact details later on in the slideshow. So what do we know about Jesus as a man? If you were to type something into Google like Bible facts about Jesus or similar, you would get over 17 million results. And this is part of the reason why I struggled a bit when I was trying to figure out how best to approach this subject. So here's just a few facts that the Bible tells us about Jesus. Now there are, as we said, so many more things, and these are just ones that I believe are really important and hopefully might lead you to have more questions. Jesus was born of a woman, the Virgin Mary, and I've got the verses where these things are found as we go through. I won't read them all for time, but you can look them up after. Jesus was immaculately conceived by God's power and Joseph was his earthly father. Those things are all found in Matthew chapter 1. He is therefore God's son, not God the son, as believed by many religions. The Bible is clear about this. Jesus also got baptised. And we read about that in Mark chapter 1, verse 9, which says, It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is mentioned, prophesied about and alluded to it extensively throughout the Bible. Right from the Old Testament, starting in Genesis and running all the way through. Now we refer to this as the golden thread. Jesus had the same nature as you and I, that is, sinful human nature. He, however, did not sin and fulfilled God's law, known as the law of Moses, perfectly, culminating in him willingly sacrificing himself. He was, in fact, crucified by the Romans at the urging of the Jewish leaders, and he didn't resist, even though it was totally unjust. For about three years prior to his death, he travelled around and preached to anyone who would listen. Jesus often spoke in parables. And in fulfilling the law of Moses when he was crucified, he actually did away with it and replaced it with a new one, known as the law of Christ or the law of love. And we read about this in Romans chapter 8. It says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. 
And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Now, after his crucifixion and death, the Bible tells us that Jesus rose from the dead after three days. After rising, he appeared first to his close followers and then also to many other people. And then he ascended into heaven. He now sits at the right hand of God and is a mediator between God and us. Jesus' work and sacrifice is what allows us the opportunity to approach God and ask for forgiveness of our sins. It is also the only way we can approach God. We read about that in John chapter 3, where we read, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus is the cornerstone of God's plan and purpose with the earth. He willingly and perfectly carried out the tasks required of him by his Father. And we read about that in Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now these are just a few of the facts about Jesus that can be found in the Bible. Hopefully they raise other questions in your mind. Again, feel free to contact us and ask. Again, I will provide those details after. Or even better, pick up a Bible and read and study it more for yourselves. Now, what about his mission? Well, to sum up in two words, Jesus' mission and message, it was the gospel. Let's have a look at this video, which provides a pretty good explanation about this gospel message. Just a little disclaimer that there's a couple of subtle hints in the video that God is Jesus and vice versa. Now, as I said earlier, the Bible actually doesn't support that as a belief, and neither do we. So let's have a look. There are four books in the Bible that are ancient biographies of Jesus. The Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And while individual stories about Jesus and his teachings are familiar to many people, these books have way more to offer if we read them from beginning to end and see how they connect Jesus' story into the overall biblical storyline. So let's talk about how to read the gospel. First of all, this word gospel, what does it mean? Well, it means good news. Which raises the question, good news about what? Well, in Mark's gospel, Jesus enters the story announcing that the time is fulfilled. God's kingdom has come near, so turn around and trust this good news. So the good news is about God's kingdom arriving, what does that mean? Well, it's Jesus' way of summarizing the whole biblical story that leads up to himself. The whole story. Okay, give me the short version. Well, the story begins with God creating a good world and then appointing humanity as his representatives to rule it. But then the humans rebel over and over, leading to a world of violence and death. That's a problem. But God's committed to making it work. 
So he chooses Abraham and his family to restart the project. Then through Moses, God brings the family into a garden land of abundance so that he can restore all of the nations through them. Right, Israel becomes a kingdom with amazing kings like David, but eventually Israel rebels too, and it leads them into destruction. But Israel's prophets said that God wasn't giving up. He was going to personally come and restore Israel so that his justice and peace could spread to all nations and to all creation. This hope was called the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus said he was bringing to Israel. Yes, Jesus' good news is about God's kingdom, the new creation that was arriving to restore humanity to their role as God's partners in ruling the world. This is why the gospel has so many stories about Jesus liberating people from death and disease, along with all of his teachings about generosity to the poor or forgiveness and loving your enemies. He was inviting people to live in God's new world. Exactly. And so this is one of the main goals of the gospel, to show how Jesus is bringing the whole biblical story to its fulfillment. So that's why the gospel authors are constantly appealing to the Hebrew scriptures while telling the story of Jesus. Yeah, like when Jesus is born in Bethlehem, Matthew reminds us that this was anticipated by the prophet Micah. And he directly quotes from Micah. Yeah, these direct quotes are really common. But more often, the gospel authors weave biblical phrases into the story without telling you, so you can discover it for yourself. Like when Jesus is baptized and God announces from the skies, you are my son, my beloved, with you I am well pleased. Now, if you do some digging, you'll find that God's statement blends together phrases from three biblical texts to identify Jesus as the royal son of David, the seed of Abraham, and the servant who's going to suffer for the sins of his people. Well, that is subtle. Yes, and the gospel accounts do this on every page. Every book is constantly showing how all of the biblical stories about Abraham or Moses and David and all the prophets, all of it points forward to Jesus. Now, why are there four different accounts? Wouldn't one be enough? Well, the diversity is on purpose. Each of the four gospel authors has shaped and arranged their stories about Jesus differently, so they can emphasize different things about him. Matthew presents Jesus as a greater Moses, and so he's grouped Jesus' teachings into five large blocks, just like the five books of the Torah. Luke highlights how Jesus is God's royal servant from the book of Isaiah, who brings God's light to the nations. Mark presents Jesus as a new start for humanity, bringing the mystery of God's new creation crashing into the present. And John focuses on Jesus' claim to be Yahweh, the God of Israel, become human, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. Those are really different from each other, but they all tell the same basic story. A man from the region of Galilee teaching this good news, but who's ultimately crucified as a criminal. Yes, all four books of the gospel are showing how the arrival of God's kingdom through Jesus led him up to the cross, where he was enthroned as the king of God's new world. He's given a robe, a crown, and a scepter. Right. And as Jesus suffers the consequences of humanity's rebellion, he's showing that the power of God's kingdom comes through his love and self-sacrifice. And when he's raised from the dead, we're watching the dawn of the new creation. So, the Gospel authors don't just want their readers to know about the good news of God's kingdom. They want them to become a part of it. Yes, the Gospel is designed to persuade us to trust and follow Jesus so that we can participate in the new creation that He began. Okay, so hopefully that gave us a good fairly quick overview of some parts of Jesus' mission and also a little bit of a summary of the gospel message. Now, the other thing I would like to mention about the mission and message of Jesus is that he constantly taught about the need for and the importance of love. One of his most well-known statements comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, where we read, then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? There were literally hundreds of rules and regulations in the law. 
Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's quite clear, isn't it? There were literally hundreds of laws and regulations. But unless they were followed and carried out with love in someone's heart, Jesus was saying that the whole thing was pointless. Now that idea was pretty revolutionary in itself, but Jesus didn't stop there. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gives some more advice about our behaviour. He said, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. In the Gospel of John chapter 13, talking about his fulfilment of the old law, Jesus sets out the foundation for this new way. He said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. You're hopefully starting to see why this new way is known as the law of love. It was very different to the very hard line law of Moses that the Jews had been trying to follow up till that time. Now, just in case you were wondering about Jesus' credentials to give out all this advice about love, we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's exactly what Jesus did for all of us. He was a man who devoted his life to helping others and to serving his Father in heaven. He was kind, humble, non-judgmental and forgiving of all. His mission and message was all about the good news and hope for the world in the form of the kingdom of God that was to come through himself. What we have already heard is known as the gospel. This man gave his life to provide hope to anyone who is prepared to listen. So what does this message and his death mean for us? Well, keep watching and Brother Simon will tell us all about it in part two, which is what his death means for you. Hopefully, you might have some questions. Feel free to contact us either by our website, which is knowyourbible.com.au, or you can email us at knowyourbibleoz at outlook.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks very much for taking the time to watch.